Well, praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. God does good things, doesn't he? He takes good care of us and blesses us and gives us things that we don't deserve. Amen. Amen. Genesis 13. <clears throat> um, if you go back and uh, remember some of the things I've been saying, you know, with all these Genesis chapters, I throw a number at you, the number that's in the chapter. And, um, you know, God showed me this early on when I started studying numbers in the Bible. I felt like the Holy Ghost was saying, Mike, the number meanings are in the Genesis chapter. So prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So I said, I don't believe that till I see it. And God didn't have a problem with that because that's what he wanted me to do. That's what he told us to do. Seek, search the scriptures. So I, I look at the number 13 and I look at all the things in the Bible that are 13s. And you've got the fall of Jericho after they march 13 times. You have, uh, I could list them, Deuteronomy 13, um, Acts chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13. You have all these 13s in the Bible and they deal with the beast or the false prophet somehow, some way. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, 13 words. So on that side is the evil part of it. And then you have, and you know, I mentioned about harlots, that they do what they do as long as you pay them. They'll love you as long as you give them something in return. Uh, but God's different. Uh, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So we don't give and cannot give anything to God that he didn't already make. It's already his. So what gift, what price can we bring to God to get him to love us? It's, he just loves us. Unconditional love. And there you see the difference. And we noted that. You know, the charity chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, it's got 13 verses in it. And the 13th verse is, now abide these three, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. I mentioned this morning, charity covers the multitude of sins. When you have love for people, you not only forgive them, they also, are, you also are forgiven. Because you did what Jesus said. So... We have an example of that acted out in Genesis 13. In the primary story that's in this chapter. Let's pick it up in verse 5. We had already mentioned that God had made Abram wealthy. And he was blessed. And God had increased his flocks. He had servants. And I don't think Abram, as some slave master... Beating and whipping his, you know, black slaves or whatever. I think he was a man that took care of his servants. There's some people who just, that's what they do. They serve other people. They're, it's their gift. It's their talent. They're good at it. They're not, they don't have the kind of thinking that, you know, causes them to increase in wealth. God gives that as a gift to some people. I'm glad he didn't give it to me, you know. Because I'd be wasting it all on this $1 billion lottery ticket. Did you hear about that? So, if you bought that ticket and win, call me. No. I've always said, and I said it this weekend, we brought it up. I said, if I was meant to win something like that, I'd be driving down the road, roll the window down, and the winning ticket come flying in the car and land in my lap. And a lady at the camp meeting told me, she said, that happened. She, acts, I don't know, found a lottery ticket out in a parking lot or something like that, picked it up, and it, $500 lottery ticket. And I'm going, that was my ticket. That was supposed to land in mine. So, but I, I think knowing Abram, that he probably treated his servants well. He took good care of them. We know this about Abram because... When he fathered the child from Hagar, Ishmael. And when Sarah finally conceived and brought forth Isaac, 
Hagar and Ishmael are persecuting Sarah and Isaac. And Sarah's complaining to Abraham, you know, you got to get rid of this woman. Well, it grieved Abram. It grieved him. He didn't, he didn't want to do it. He went to God and God said, remove her. God had a plan. He wanted to show something by that. And by the way, God took care of them. He blessed them. He didn't let them perish in the wilderness. But I think Abram treated his servants well. I think they were probably well taken care of, well fed, and so on. So in verse 5, we have Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. The land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. Now pay attention to this. Contentions rise up. Disagreements between people, sometimes bitter disagreements. If you remember, Paul had a falling out with John Mark. John Mark started out going with the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey. John Mark could not keep up with Paul. Paul was er up early, staying up late, and John Mark couldn't take it, and he left. And when it came time for Paul's second missionary journey, John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, wanted to go with Paul. And Paul said, forget it, you're not going with me. You'll fall out like you did last time. I mean, Paul was being kind of rough here. And there was a bitter contention there. And it took Barabbas, whose name means what? Son of Consolation. And he goes to John Mark and consoles him and says... John, won't you, won't you come with me? Luke will go with Paul. You come with me. I'm not as hardcore as Paul is. I take it a little bit slower. You go with me. And even though there was a sharp contention between them, they were able to separate. Did God use Paul after that? Did God use Mark after that? He wrote the gospel of Mark. So those things happen every now and then. And sometimes you just have to, and that's what happened. There was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So you have lost people who are watching Abram and Lot and how they're getting along. Lost people will watch these kind of things. and They will use them for a reason. I ain't never going to no church ever again. I was in a church split and I ain't never going back. And that's happened here before. When Melissa and I were teenagers, there was a bitter, bad split. Name calling. One woman got up and slapped my, my favorite deacon in the whole world, Brother Dale McCurry. And loved, godly man, I loved that man. Got up and slapped him across the face during this business meeting in this church. It was wicked what happened. And um, so a Abram in verse 8 says, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between me, my herdmen, and thy herdmen. For we be what? Brethren. That matters. Is not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will, or the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes, beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. Sodom, get this in your mind, Sodom looked like Eden. Turn to Joel. That just hit me. You know what I'm talking about, John? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe I'm thinking of something. Else. Maybe I might change it now that you think I, you know it. Joel chapter 2. Look at verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. That's what the devil's army will do. When the devil's army moves through a person's family, 
It could have been the Garden of Eden before that, and it's a desolate wilderness afterwards. He's destroyed everything. When the devil moves through a church, when the devil moves through a denomination, when the devil moves through a person's life, when that evil army does that, things could have been the Garden of Eden before. Now it's a just it's nothing. So that just occurred to me when I read that. It was as the water of God or the garden of God. Uh, verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for a good day. We thank you, God, for the good things that you've done today. Lord, I love you and I rejoice in it. I pray, Lord, that you would bless it. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us this morning. And Father, for the, the impact and the blessing that we had on people's lives this morning. We thank you, dear God, for the coming week. Once again, we're going to try to help your people. Because we love them. And you have fixed it in our heart to love these people. To care about them. And Father, that's really what some people just need. They're not asking for millions of dollars. I can't give them all jobs. They're not asking for that. They just need somebody that cares for them. Everybody does. And Father, teach us meekness. Teach us what it means. Teach us how to exhibit it faithfully and truthfully. A false meekness, Father, is just hypocrisy. Show us how to be meek. Show us how, dear God, to yield up what we think our rights are. What we think we are owed. Help us, dear God, to yield those over. And Lord, even in, the, even in the face of the devil, help us, dear God, to yield to you and to be meek. And then show us what blessings you can give us because of that. We love you and we ask you to fill our minds and our hearts with your word tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, what is... Meekness. Turn to turn to Matthew five. What is meekness? Is it timidity? Is it being timid? Is it being afraid of everything? Is it um, weakness? What is biblical meekness? Could be described a lot of ways. I think one of the best ways is. Yielding your rights. Okay. Now, um, traveling Friday and Saturday, I, I've kind of changed and tried to change some of my driving habits. The old me, if the lane was mine, you can't have it. I own it from here to Oklahoma City. You can't have it. You're not getting it. I was here first. Get away from me. Uh, but I found myself, especially with truck drivers. Those guys, God bless them. They're on that road every day of the week. They're driving for hours. They're moving things across this country. They are literally the grease on the cog of merchandising and income profit in this country. It is the truck drivers. And those guys, some of them are pretty rough. They live on the road. Um, you see a lot of them. They have a lot of bad habits. They, my uncle was a truck driver. He smoked probably four packs a day every day. Just sitting in the cab of that truck. Just suck them down one after another. And so I've learned that if I'm, if I'm pulling in a lane and a semi wants to get over because the truck in front of him ain't quite getting it up the hill, the old me used to go and hog the lane. But I find myself backing off, flashing my lights and letting that guy know, come on over. Because I pulled that 
camper trailer around and I know what it's like having something that long wanting to get over into a lane and nobody's letting you do it. So, I mean, you got, you think about how other people see this thing. But in, in many ways, it is yielding your rights. What you think you have a right to, yielding those rights. What did Paul say when it came to uh, going to courts against our brethren? Paul forbid it. And he said, here it is, two brothers who apparently... Are, are so bullheaded and stubborn that they refuse to work it out among themselves and then they'll take it to a an earthly courtroom full of lost people. And the lost judge, he's got to sit and hear about how these two guys that go to the same church together can't get along and they're suing one another in courts. And Paul said it should not be so. He said, do you not know that we're going to be judging this earth? We're going to be judging angels. And he said, if we cannot even judge in the least of the matters locally, how can we expect to be judging the entire world? Boy, you had a point there. And he said in that, he said, it is better for you to take the wrong and absorb the loss than it is for you to sue a brother in an, in an earthly court. He said, you can have a church trial. Pick somebody in your church that is meek. Somebody who doesn't play favorites. Somebody that you think is fair. And you let them hear the case and let them decide it. Did you know that's legal? That could be worked out? Judge Judy on TV and these other judges, they are not technically legal judges with legal jurisdiction other than she acts as an arbiter, a mediator. You have to sign a contract. Now, when you go to an earthly courtroom, an earthly judge, a civil judge, you don't sign a contract agreeing to the judge's decision. If that judge says it's this way, it's this way. You don't get a choice. When you go on to Judge Judy, you have to sign a contract saying whatever she decides, I agree to abide by it. And of course, the, the show pays the damages. If you lose and it's $5,000, the show pays the winner the $5,000. You're not out anything. You just got humiliated in front of 150 million people. Okay? I, I would never go on there. But anyway, so it's, Paul said you're actually better off taking wrong and having a loss than you are to sue a brother. He said meekness. Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is, and what's in heaven? Streets of gold, gates of pearl, walls made out of jewels and gems, and it's a dazzling city of lights. It is the wealthiest city in the world, and we get it for free. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he said, blessed are the meek. The meek. For they shall inherit the earth. The opposite of that would be people like Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had it in his mind. He was going to conquer the world. And boy, he got a big part of it. However many he had to kill. However many people died. Did not matter to him. There was not enough blood to be spilled that would quench his desire for ruling over earthly property. And yet Jesus said to those who don't see the world that way as things to be gained and things to be conquered. He said, I'll give you the whole world. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. So that to me is... The ex exhibition of biblical meekness. Whose property were they on? Abram's. Who had a right to them? Abram. Lot was his nephew. Abram probably helped him out with sheep. Gave him some of his servants. Gave him some of his tents. Helped raise him. 
helped teach him the things that he knew. And then all of a sudden, you've got those two men. Lot said, we were at the well first. And your guys took over and run us off of the well. Now our sheep ain't got no water. What are we supposed to do about it? So I told my guys that if they got to the well and they were feeding their sheep, and if your guys came over, we're going to beat them. That was that kind of stuff going on. They were probably literally fighting one another, phys physically fighting over well waters and grasslands and everything else. And Abram said, this ain't right. For the world to see us fighting one another, this has got to stop. And Abram could have said, all of this is mine. And if you don't like it, you go pick someplace else. And you go live there, but I'm not having it. And I ain't giving you nothing. That He could have said it. He had a right to it. But that's not what he did. He literally gave Lot the choice of the location and what he wanted to take. Put no restrictions on him whatsoever. Lot, you go to the right hand, I'll go to the left. You go to the left hand, I'll go to the right. Doesn't matter to me. You, you get the pick. And God bless that. We have another situation. Turn to Numbers 12. God described here Moses as being the meekest man ever. Moses is in charge of what is approaching probably close to a million people. And... I'm telling you, it's not easy to rule over people. It's not easy to be the leader, to be the head. But he's doing the best he can. He's not perfect at it. He makes mistakes. His father-in-law, Jethro, has to get involved and say, Moses, it's not right what you're doing. You're trying to judge everybody's piddly little thing. You can't do that. You need to select judges that'll help you out. So Moses did. Moses could have said to Jethro, you know what, Jethro? This is not this is not your business. Go get get out of here. Go mind your own business. Don't tell me what to do. But Moses didn't do that. Moses listened to him and God blessed it. So now numbers twelve, Moses' own sister and Aaron, his brother, got into it. First we had the gainsaying of Korah, where Korah rose up against Moses. Korah, this is family. Korah was Moses' first cousin, and said, "Who gave you the right? Who called you to be God?" Who told you you were in charge? Well, all of these people, they don't need you to lead them. And Moses said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything. But I'll tell you what, we'll see. If God doesn't do anything, then we'll know that you were right. But let's just say that if God does some new thing and the ground opened up and swallows all of you, then we'll know that it was God. Korah's probably laughing and going, you idiot. So in Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, and Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. I wonder why they had a problem with it. Was it because she was Ethiopian? Was she black? We don't know. But they just didn't like her. She ain't one of us. You know how that is. She not one of us. He married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? So now, and this is, this is Miriam. This is the, the, sister that saved his life, put him in the little ark of bulrushes and sent him down the Nile River and, and just followed him to make sure he was taken care of and on and on and on and like that. But now she's rising up against her own brother and she says, who do you think you are? And it, was, it had nothing to do with Moses being in charge. They didn't like his wife. And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. You ought to jot that down somewhere. Now the man Moses was what? Very meek. Above all men which were upon the face of the earth. Moses probably at this time still had the rod of God. And he probably could have went whap. Or turned it into a serpent or something like that. But what happened was the Lord stepped in and stood up for, for Moses. Because God knew Moses' meekness and Moses was not going to try to defend himself. 
He was not going to lay accusations against his own blood, his own brother, his own sister. He was not going to do that. So God intervened and stepped in and spoke up. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto the Miriam. Come out, you three out of the tabernacle. That's like Mama saying, get out here right now. All three of you. Uh-oh. Verse 5, And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. We know he didn't see his face, but he saw something. Maybe the silhouette of a man. Has anybody, anybody but me ever had a dream where Jesus was in it? Anybody else? Okay. Could you see his face? Me neither. In the dream that I had about Jesus, it was a short dream, but I couldn't see his face. So... This kind of how I envision this going on. He, God's saying, I'll show him my similitude. He shall behold me personally. Did Aaron ever see God? No. Aaron's, Aaron did not go up to Mount Sinai with Moses. Aaron stayed down with the people, remember, and made that calf. Moses went up there and saw God. Aaron never did. Did Miriam ever see God? No. Did God ever speak to Miriam personally? No. And he's telling this. He said... If a prophet, if I'm going to speak to a prophet, I'll give him a dream or a vision. But not Moses. If I want to talk to Moses, I show up in Moses' tent. And I speak to him man to man. Mano y mano. One on one. He beholds my similitude, my image. And I say the words and he hears me standing there. But I don't do that with anybody else. So what does that tell you? Here's God saying... What does that tell you about who I think should be in charge? With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and he departed. If you look at verse, uh, let's see, what chapter is that? Chapter 12. If you look at, you keep reading that story. Verse 10, the cloud departed off from the tabernacle and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Boom. Instantaneous leprosy all over. Why? Because it represents sin, disobedience to God. And behold, she was leprous. What was the law of leprosy? If you had leprosy, where did you have to live? Get out. And even Moses... Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. Aaron's like, I don't want that. I saw what you did to my older sister. Sister. She made mistakes that I never did because I watched and I went, Oh, I'm not doing that. No, I made all new ones. But anyway, um, Aaron said that unto Moses in verse 12. Let her not be as one as dead, but of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Notice Moses. He's not saying, God, thank you for doing that. Get her. How dare she speak against me? He never did that. He prayed that God would heal her. And the Lord had to remind Moses. Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. Moses, I'll forgive her. But I am going to punish her. And Moses, let that be. Because with you, I don't have to punish you. You do what I say. And the only one time that Moses didn't, it cost him being able to go into the promised land. But did God stay mad at Moses? No, because he shows up with Elijah when Jesus is transfigured. So 
Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Moses never stood up for himself. Let God judge. Let God judge people. Let God chew them out. Let God whip them. Let God deal with them. That's a lesson, a hard lesson that I had to learn. I've told you about the lady used to live over here, Kay, and how her little boy would sneak over and play on our playground. Well, it made the women nervous. And they said, oh, he's going to get hurt and they're going to sue us. And so I kept running him off. And finally, I, I got tired of him running over here every time. And I finally hollered at him from the balcony over here. And I said, Cody, go home. Well, he went in and told his mama. I yelled at him. So I'm in my office, minding my old business. Got my back turned to the door. Next thing I hear, slam! Eyes got big like this. I turned around and she was standing there and rays were shooting out of her eyes at me. Burning holes in my stomach. And she said, how dare you speak to my kid that way? And I had words with her. And I said, he keeps sneaking over here after I've told him he can't play over here. And she left. And a year later, God, I mean, God smote me over that. And I walked over there to her house one day, knocked on the door and her son answered the door. I said, Cody, is your mom home? He said, well, she's taking a nap. And I said, I think she'll want to wake up for this. So I don't know what he told her, but she came to the door going, yes. And I said, Kay, I want you to know God's been dealing with me. And I said, I am very, very sorry for reacting the way I did toward your son. I'm very, very sorry for how I reacted to you. You were just defending your son. And I said, I want you to know I sincerely apologize. And if Cody wants to come over and play any time... When our kids are not there, he's more than welcome to it. And her jaw went. And tears in her eyes, she said, you know, I was thinking about getting back in church somewhere. I'll be at your church Sunday morning. I had put a stone of offense in front of that woman. And did not display biblical meekness to a lost woman. You know, God let me save that woman's life. She was over here mowing the grass back out here one day and I saw her lawnmower tip over. And she had passed out or something like that. And I went and got her husband and we pulled that off of her and they took her to the hospital. I never did find out what was wrong. But they've moved now and they've moved knowing that there's God's people in this church. It may never, she may, I don't know where she's going to spend eternity. But I was determined it wasn't going to be my fault if she went to hell. Amen. That's meekness. Do we not have a right to our property? Do we not have a right to tell people you can't come on here when these people are selling drugs out of the basement and we're trying to run off the dope heads and everything else and they're out here sucking meth right out here in the parking lot. All, do we not have a right? Do we not have a right, that guy up there that passed out, to have him call the police, have him arrested? Well, that's not why I called the police. I called the police because they carry Narcan. Saved that man's life. And he, he has thanked us for that. That's, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. We get so protective over piddly things. That's my screwdriver. That's my pair of scissors. You don't touch that. We get that way over tiny things and treat people wrong because of it. God will never bless that. Psalm 22, verse 26. The meek shall eat and shall be satisfied. So what are you afraid of? I mean, he said that we not only would eat, but we'd like it. Meek shall eat and shall be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. God promises that to meek people. Psalm 25, 9. The meek he will guide in judgment and the meek he will teach his way. But God cannot teach anybody 
with a bullheaded, stubborn, pride, arrogant heart. Won't teach them a thing. That's what God did with me many years ago. He had to break me, soften me, get me to quit thinking I was Mr. Know-it-all. Then he could teach me. Psalm 37, 11, the meek shall inherit the earth. Is that true? So who's coming back with Jesus? The meek. Ten thousands of his saints riding on horses. God's going to give them possession of the entire earth. And I've never asked for it. I've never asked God, God, give me the whole world. I want to conquer the whole world. Never asked for it. God just gave it to me. You know, I didn't sit for years praying for God to give me a ministry in Kenya. That was on somebody else's heart. God brought it to me. I said, okay. But God gave me that as a gift. And I don't deserve that. Never have. Never will. But it's been one of the greatest blessings for this church. To be able to minister to those people over there. Uh, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The Lord lifteth up the meek. God, God will exonerate you. When you sit as I used to do and worry that somebody was going to put a negative comment on one of my YouTube videos. How dare they do that? I'm going to take that down. I don't want anybody seeing that. And I just got to where I don't. And it's Facebook the same way. I just got to where I leave it on there. Now I'm coming out with a video tonight that I guarantee you in a week's time you read the comments under that video because they're going to call me a shill. They're going to call me I'm working for the New World Order. I'm a Freemason. I'm a wolf. They're going to call me every name in the book. Okay, And I just don't fight that anymore. I, I don't like it. But I don't, I don't worry about that. I don't read them. Most of the time I don't read them. I don't read the comments on practically anything I do. Because I didn't put it up there to appease people's opinion of me. I put it up there because I think it's what God told me to say. And some people are going to like it, and some people are not going to like it, and that's just all there is to it. But I'm not going to get into it with everybody. And, I, and there are people who literally want to pick a fight with me and get me into it with them over something I said. And I, I'm just, I used to do that. I just, I don't do it anymore. It doesn't, doesn't accomplish anything, number one. And number two... What's more important? I've already said what I said. If I'm wrong, who's going to whip me over it? God will. And he does. But, and in this message coming out today, I'm whipping myself. John heard it. He knows what I said. So it's best that you let God stand up for you. And don't worry about what others think. If they're going to think negative about you, they just... You know, I had a man... To, this At the time, the man was lost. And he got saved afterward. But you know what he said about people like that? He said, Mike, they're not mad at you. They're just mad at themselves. And they're taking it out on you. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. Psalm 149, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people, and he will beautify the meek with salvation. Only meek people get saved. Only meek people are saved. Because what does it take, John, to turn your life over to Christ? A recognition that you were wrong. One of the hardest things for people to do is to recognize and admit when they were wrong. Our pride, our ego kicks in. We say, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. 
It's the best thing in the world to do. Because that's the people that God is going to save. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen? Isaiah 11, verse 4. But with the righteous shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a capitalist. But capitalism has its limits. And there is zero doubt in my mind that the wealthy of this world are ripping off people. Unfair business practices, monopolizing things, using the leverage that they have with congressmen to get bills. It's like to deal with the people of California that said we want everything that's been genetically modified in our food to be labeled. This contains GMO, genetically modified food in it. They said we want it mandatory labeled. Monsanto and the other companies poured in millions of dollars paid off all those politicians and the bill never passed because they didn't want it passed. They don't want you to know. They say you, have, you don't have a right to know what we give you and what we feed you. You have no right to know that. That's just like all that stuff going on in Congress and going on right now. And they say we don't have a right to know what's going on there. That's our government. That's our house. Amen. And so he said he will reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Equity. Meaning God will make it equal. If somebody is taking advantage of you, let God deal with it. God will make it equal. I heard Reg say it like this one time, because Reg is a, is a rancher, he's a cattleman. And he said, you got mad, you threw a fit and a spell because your neighbor's bull came over into your yard and you hollered at your neighbor and you threatened to shoot the bull and everything like that. He said, why don't you just let God have it? God will, let you, God will end up giving you the bull. I went, yeah, that sounds about like God. He'll slay the wicked. Zephaniah 2, 3, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. Submission, which, uh, to be honest with you, most conservative Christian Americans are not meek people. When it comes to what we say is our rights, like a Second Amendment, and I'm for the Constitution, don't get me wrong. But we're ready to fight a war that I'm pretty sure, I'm not positive we'd be able to win for our constitutional rights. Would it not be better to let God have it. Amen. Now that sounds like a cop out. Like I don't want to fight. Like I want to just give up. It's not. I'm actually using a better weapon against the wicked. Because think about all the liberal people in this, in this country. Just the liberal people. Who actually did legally vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> okay. So if you got rid of the Joe Biden government, by the way, it's stacked against us. If Biden's out, Kamala's in, Pelosi's going to follow her. And if we get rid of Kamala, Pelosi's president, and Schumer's going to be Biden. We, we are, we lost it. So if you get rid of that wicked government, you're going to have to get rid of every liberal person in this country in order to maintain what you think would be a decent way to live in this country. Is that possible? God can do it. God sure can. So he said, seek righteousness, seek meekness, and it may, sh it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Did you see that? Did God not say here that he's going to get Joe Biden? Did he not just say that here? Sure he did. And all the people in all those precincts that helped him cheat. God's going to get every one of them. So would it be better for God to deal with it and hide us so that we didn't get shot? And them, you know, 
the IRS has the power to take every dime out of our church bank account if they so see fit. If they think that we have violated something as far as federal laws or whatever, they could seize our bank account. We'd be out of business. So wouldn't it be better to let God deal with it? Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you and lean, learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. The yoke of Christ is a yoke of submission and meekness. And people tell me, I'll never submit to the new world order. I'll never, I'll never give it. I'll never do this. And anytime I preach on Romans 13, they come out at me. God never tells us to yield to any wicked government. Oh, yes, he does. In fact, God is the one who puts us under evil authority. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of verses. Meekness. Learn it. Learn it. Now, take that, I guess, in the context of Ecclesiastes. There is a time and a place for everything. There's a time for peace and there is a time for war. But if I'm ever going to be put in a position where I'm going to have to take another man's life, it better be the right cause. Because that's a big thing. And uh, people ask me, what do you th- Pastor, what are we going to do? Are we going to stand for this? I mean, should we rise up? I mean, is God going to get us for not going to war? Hey, I can't tell you that God has told us to do anything yet. And until I know what God's t- going to tell us to do, I don't think we ought to do anything until God says it. But who knows? So learn your lessons. Learn how to yield your rights. Learn how to let somebody else have that chair. Learn how to let somebody else get in front of you at Walmart. Learn these things. Because they are what defines the difference between us and them. Father, this book is right. Its words, its precepts are true. And Lord, they, in my flesh, I do not like living by them. That much I know. My flesh wants to conquer, wants to rule over, wants to be always right, never wrong. God, I'm just wicked that way. But I'm trying, God. I'm trying to learn meekness. I'm trying to learn what it means to yield to others. To submit to people, God. In a righteous way, in a righteous cause. And I know, God, that we're going to stand for the gospel. We're going to stand for the truth. We'll die. If we have to, we're willing to yield our lives. But, Father, I do believe that any future war, this, it won't be like 1776. It'll be something that I doubt seriously That we would ever really prevail without losing much lives and much property. So, Father, in the absence of my wisdom to know what to do about the wrongs that are in our country, I have no choice but to wait on you and to follow you and to submit to you and let you deal with it. And teach us, God, to be meek and lowly and have a quiet spirit and to pray, Father, for our politicians and our kings and our presidents that we may live a quiet and peaceable life. And Father, right now, that's the only thing I know to do. So, Father, we pray, God, please, God, give us wisdom for what's coming in the future, because we could be wrong about everything. So that's why you told us to lean not to our own understanding. Bless your word tonight. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.